The subject of today's show isn't a deranged sociopath or a holistic healer getting high on her own shungite supply. She's not even an aged former rocker with a messiah complex. She is an accomplished, legitimate science communicator, a prolific theoretical physicist, and somebody whose YouTube channel I normally watch. I even own her book. If you haven't seen her video on the delayed choice quantum eraser, you must. It is easily the best video on that topic. But more importantly, when it comes to her video I'm covering today, she's somebody who could have been more careful. Sabina Hassenfelder recently released a video about the dangers of 5G. You know, the phone network that's been out for almost five years, that's been the subject of more conspiracy theories than nights Mark Steele has spent in prison. Her video is called 5G, The Trouble with the New Phone Network. But she's actually talking about just one little bit of 5G, the 5G upper band. 5G NR or 5G upper band is what the anti-5G truthers often refer to as the new frequencies, the frequencies that have been reallocated to phone operators. We all know that there are no new frequencies since the radio spectrum has existed for eternity. What we are talking about here is just a reallocation of a band that was mostly used for fixed dish-to-dish -dish communication. These bands are intended to help phone networks cope with densely populated places where everybody wants to use their phones at the same time, and sometimes there's not enough bandwidth. The new frequencies are going to enable a new kind of cell station that works at lower power, the microcell. In the 1G and 2G era, a cell would transmit a signal a few hundred watts over a radius of a few thousand meters. The signal would be radiated in all directions, regardless of how near or far the mobile user might be. Newer improvements limited the transmission to 120 degrees or narrower. By contrast, these new 5D microcells typically have less than 5 watts of power. They often use beam-forming antennas, which means that these devices don't transmit in all directions. They send a signal only to the mobile device they're communicating with at that moment. Despite their size, microcells can handle very high bit rates. This is possible in part because of those new frequencies. I mean, upper band. It's because those higher frequencies don't travel very far. The signals are easily obstructed by houses, leaves, paper, and raindrops, which is actually a good thing. It means you can have more of these low power devices nearer to each other. They won't interfere with each other. In telecom jargon, that's called densification. It's also considered to be a good thing since the cells transmit at a much lower power, increasing safety. And as a bonus, higher frequencies can carry more data. Microcells using the high band will allow phone companies to scale their capacity to meet consumer demand. It means you might be able to get a signal in the middle of OzFest. But unless you're in a very busy place with the latest infrastructure, you won't be using the upper bands just yet. This technology is only useful in crowded places where everybody wants to use their phone. It would be useless in a sparsely populated place, like a mountain or a forest. Put a pin in that thought, it's going to be relevant later. The first part of her video, I'm going to ignore mostly. It's about the possible health effects of the upper band frequencies. Sabina says, quite correctly, that there hasn't been much research into the health effects of the high band mil millimeter waves on health and wildlife. And you know what? She's right. There hasn't been. She also points out that there's no evidence suggesting that it's harmful either. She strongly implies that the evidence is inconclusive either way. The solution, she says, is more research, and that's something I'm on board with. It's the second bit of her video, where things start to become a bit sloppy. Let's talk about a known side effect of 5G. It's a headache for atmospheric scientists, that's meteorologists, but also climate scientists. And yes, that means 5G affects the weather forecast. Among the most important data that goes into weather and climate models is the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. This is measured from satellites. You measure the amount of water vapor by measuring electromagnetic radiation that is scattered by the water molecules in the atmosphere. Each molecule reacts to radiation in particular frequency ranges, and that allows you to count how many of those molecules there are. The frequency that satellites use to look for water is, you guessed it, 23.80 gigahertz. 
Sabina argues that the new 5G upper band will cause problems for our weather forecasters because the low end of the 5G upper band is a mere 450 megahertz away from the 23.8 gigahertz, the frequency used by NOAA's weather satellites. She's specifically talking about a group of instruments launched starting in 2002 called AMSR2, the Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer. These devices measure cosmic background radiation reflected from the Earth's atmosphere. The readings are useful for weather forecasting, and people have suggested they could be threatened by 5G. The issue is now that this water vapor signal is uncomfortably close to one of the 5G bands, which covers the range from 24.25 to 27.5 gigahertz. You might say that's still 400 megahertz away from the water vapor measurements, and that's right. But the 5G band doesn't abruptly stop at a particular frequency, it's more that it tapers out. The emission outside of the assigned band is called leakage. That leakage creates noise, and this noise is the problem. She argues that out-of-band emissions may raise the noise floor enough to cause interference with certain satellite measurements. To understand this, we need a little background. When radios transmit at a certain frequency, they don't perfectly transmit on that frequency. There will always be a little above and below the desired frequency. Sabina is calling this leakage, an appropriate term. The amount of leakage is measured in decibel watts. It's not crucial that you understand this unit. What matters is that you understand that this number tells us how aggressively the leakage is controlled. Negative 20 decibel watts is the baseline leakage that has been set by the FCC for decades. If the leakage is large enough to interfere with satellite readings, it could have a critical impact on the reliability of our weather forecasts. But how dire is this? Let's have a closer look. Sabina has found a paper that imagines what might happen to our weather forecasts when the 5G high band is switched on. However, in 2020, researchers from Rutgers University did their own study. They modeled the leakage of 5G into the water vapor signal and evaluated its impact on the weather forecast by using old data. They did a mock 12-hour forecast, one without 5G and then two with different levels of leakage power. As you can see in these figures, they found that the 5G leakage can affect the forecast up to 0.9 mm in precipitation and 1.3 degrees Celsius in temperature at 2 meters altitude. And it's not just the value that changes, but also the location. That's a significant difference, which would indeed degrade weather forecast accuracy noticeably. Can you see where those circles are? According to that study, they predicted the largest errors near the Monongahela National Forest on the West Virginia, Virginia border, or in the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas. When I was talking about forests and mountains, that was foreshadowing. Two kinds of places that will not be getting 5G upper band anytime soon. Probably never. This is a technology for inner cities, not the wilderness. When we read the paper she was referencing, modeling the impact of 5G leakage on weather prediction, by Yusufand et al., we come across this glaring admission. To assess the first order magnitude of impact, we assumed that the leakage from 5G system was uniformly distributed over the Earth's surface. Uniformly distributed, like everywhere? The mighty redwood forests, the frozen Arctic tundra, the steppes of the Andes. No, none of these places will have 5G upper band likely not any cell phone signal at all. The people who wrote this paper did not model the 5G upper band based on where it would be used. It's not even close to being reflective of actual usage. But the authors were responsible. They detailed their methodologies, they wrote out their assumptions, and they said this was preliminary. A lot more work needs to be done on the modeling before using it for real. Remember this paper. I'm going to come back to it later. The authors were asking a big what if, but Sabina treated it as if it really was. That is why most of her following conclusions are wrong. To make matters worse, most of the 5G noise will come from densely populated areas, so we'll get the least accurate forecast where people actually live. I'm not sure what Sabina is trying to imply here. She seems to be suggesting that if weather satellites misread surface conditions in big cities, it would degrade the forecasts for those same cities. 
Does Sabina think that the seven-day forecast for Baltimore comes mostly from the readings based on current conditions in Baltimore? Of course not. The forecast looks at the areas outside Baltimore, primarily from where the prevailing wind is coming from. The great thing about weather satellites is that they can take readings from hard-to-reach places, like the middle of the ocean. You don't need them to take readings from places with millions of people, like a big city. If you want to know the current temperature in Baltimore, tune in to Angry Grandma's Weather Report. She'll tell you all about the weather, at least until Wheel of Fortune comes on. This is Angry Grandma with another weather report. It's not humid. It's not hot. Satellite data is mostly needed for places without sensors or legions of angry grandmas. And what about those satellites? Sabina has a few things to say about them. This movie shows the average amount of water vapor in a column of atmosphere in a given month measured by NASA's Aqua satellite. Accurate measurements of the atmospheric water content are essential for weather forecasts. The Japanese space agency JAXA, along with NASA, launched two satellites in 2002 that carried the AMSR-2 packages. Their job was to measure the microwave radiation reflected from the Earth. NASA's Aqua satellite that Sabina mentions was the second of these platforms. But not just any old microwave radiation. This thing was quite amazing. It was sensitive enough to pick up cosmic background radiation reflected from the ocean surface or particles in the air. It could infer sea conditions and air conditions or the amount of rainfall just by how the cosmic radiation was reflected from clouds or air or the sea. In other words, this thing was really sensitive. Sensitive enough to pick up a few thousand misconfigured 5G microcells? Probably yes. If AMSR to where to have look at a major city like Seoul in South Korea, where these microcells are common, it would probably have seen a very bright pixel over the city. But did you notice my use of the past tense? That's right, AMSR2 in the Aqua satellite is no more. It has ceased to be. It has expired and gone to meet its maker. It's running down the curtain and join the crowd invisible. This is an X pattern. This is an X-radiometer. The solar cells on the first Japanese satellite stopped working in 2003. NASA's Aqua fared a little bit better, but the AMSR-2 instrument ran out of lubricant and broke down in October 2011. Sabina mentions that another satellite was launched, but she didn't mention that Japan did not launch it until May of 2012, and it didn't start sending data until July 2012. For nine months, there was no data from the 23.8 gigahertz sensors. Did weather forecasting revert to 1981 accuracy for those nine months? Were there headlines all over the globe warning everyone that the loss of this unique instrument would send weather forecasting back to the stone ages? No, I looked. There are a few websites that mention it, but nothing telling of the end of seven day forecasts. If your Google foo is better than mine, please send me the major headlines for telling the end of the world for weather forecasting from 2011. Assuming that 5G upper bands were fully deployed, would it affect weather forecasts? Probably not. To explain, we need a map of where 5G upper band will eventually be deployed. This will be primarily in densely populated areas, not in the wilderness, not even transportation corridors where the towers need to send for many kilometers. The upper bands do poorly at long distances. Here's a heat map of the population density of the U.S. This is where the 5G upper band might eventually be deployed. Notice something? Nobody lives in the Monongahela National Forest on the West Virginia, Virginia border. It will never get 5G upper band. Remember the paper Sabina mentioned, the one that modeled 5G upper band impacts? This map shows probably an overestimation of where 5G upper band will ever be used. That paper treated it as if it were everywhere. Those tiny spots that represent population centers are an insignificantly small fraction of the Earth's surface. It's really easy for the weather forecasters to ignore those pixels, knowing full well that they're probably misreads. It's really not a big deal for the data scientists who help build the weather forecast to admit or average out a few data points that are known to be false. Now, 
to what I think is the biggest blunder in Sabina's video. In this figure, you see how much more you can trust the weather forecast today than you could a few decades ago. In 1980, a three-day forecast in the Northern Hemisphere was only correct about 85% of the time. Today, it's correct more than 98% of the time. And this isn't just about deciding whether to bring an umbrella. It's relevant to warn people of dangerous weather events. A 72-hour hurricane warning today is more accurate than a 24-hour warning was 40 years ago. Hurricanes form over oceans, not land. Forecasters look at the conditions over water, not land. The Atlantic Ocean is not covered by 5G cell towers. There is no possible impact from 5G upper band in hurricane forecasting. Sabina, did you include this to scare people into thinking that hurricane forecasts might be affected by 5G? Was this fear-mongering for views? Or did you actually think that this was a problem? This is incredibly irresponsible. Fortunately, in reality, the relevant data from weather satellites won't actually be affected by 5G. So the seven-day forecast in Baltimore won't be affected. Angry Grandma will have to find something else to be mad about. The World Meteorological Organization is trying to negotiate limits with the regulating agencies in different countries. They demand that cell towers operating close to weather satellite frequencies should be limited to transmit at minus 55 decibel watt for out-of-band emission, so that's the leakage. The European Commission has agreed on minus 42 decibel watts for 5G base stations. The FCC in the US set a limit at minus 20 decibel watt. This is the logarithmic scale, so this is more than 30 orders of magnitude above the limit the meteorologists ask for. What do we learn from this? When a new technology is developed, scientists usually get there first. And when everyone else catches up, they'll interfere with the scientists, often metaphorically, but sometimes literally. This isn't a new story, of course. You only have to worry about noise from railways if you have railways and there are actually trains going on them. But a high-tech society also relies on the accuracy of data, so this is a difficult trade-off. There are no easy ways to decide what to do, but I think everyone would be better off if the worries from scientists were taken more seriously in the design stage and not grumpingly acknowledged half through a global rollout. Finally, a good old conspiracy theory. I knew it had to be in there somewhere. Every conspiracy narrative benefits from having a villain. Anybody watching Sabina's video might think the corrupting influence of big telecom has lobbied to lower the safety margins, a classic tale of big corporate greed trampling over the public good. But in truth, Sabina's got the story backwards. The phone companies did not pick the frequencies 5G uses. Neither did the engineers who designed 5G. The specific frequency ranges were unknown when 5G was designed. They were told to use these frequencies by the International Telecommunication Union. The ITU is part of the UN that manages radio frequency planning globally. When ITU determined which bands would be reallocated to consumer cell phones, the FCC in the United States and other agencies around the world began planning how to allocate these frequencies to the cell phone companies. And if the World Meteorological Society also part of the UN, or NASA, or NOAA, or other weather forecasting agencies had a problem with this, they should have registered a concern via the FCC or ITU around 2012 when research for 5G was underway. Or earlier, it's inevitable that at some time someone will use one of the nearby frequencies to do something. That is to say, if they had a concern, they could have should have said something. How about in 2002, when they first sent up a satellite so sensitive that normal legal usage would screw it up. It's great that the World Meteorological Society is asking for tighter controls now, but where were they 20 years ago? If they had done their job back then, none of this would even be discussed now. If it's not 5G or 6G that legally uses the adjacent bands, it might be allocated to something else, like the new flying cars that we were all promised in 2015. You know what we're seeing here? The normal sloppiness of governments doing what they do best, blaming someone else for their screw-ups. And YouTubers doing what they do best, making highly sensational videos to get more viewers. Myself included. 
And then there's 6G, the sixth generation of wireless networks. This is already being planned and it's supposed to use bands at even higher frequencies, above 100 gigahertz and up into the terahertz range. 6G is supposed to usher in the metaverse era with augmented and virtual reality and ultra high definition video. Yes, it's true. Future networks using newfangled bands might cause technical problems, but more likely they won't. Stuff will keep working because engineers who understand how the stuff works will work hard to ensure it does. It's literally their job. It's more likely that the FCC in the US or Ofcom in the United Kingdom or ACMA in Australia or Ndizi Kicha in Wakanda and all the other communication regulators will continue to do their jobs. The engineers from the space agencies and the telecom companies will continue to follow the regulations and we'll, we will all find better ways to use the available bands more efficiently. I'm just extrapolating from the historical trend, but Sabina has foreseen an entirely different future. But of course, the 6G range too is being used by scientists for measurements that could be compromised. For example, NASA measures ozone around 236 gigahertz and carbon monoxide at about 330.5 gigahertz. So we can pretty much expect to see the entire 5G discussion repeat for 6G. Will 6G and 7G come along and cause more interference with more satellites? I suppose we could keep playing this game and assume that 8G might blot out the sun, 9G will end civilization as we know it, and 10G will activate the beacon of Kalos to trigger a new war between the Federation and the Klingon Empire. The truth is, there aren't any specs on 6G yet, or beyond. Making pronouncements about what will happen with 6G is just as much science fiction as the beacon of Kalos. 5G is here, the upper bands have already been deployed, and weather forecasting hasn't been rolled back to asking retirees if they can feel it in their bones. And we're safe from the Klingons. For now. Sabina, you do a great job. I love your videos and I'll continue recommending them. And if you do another video on 5G, let me know and I'll help review the details. Or maybe we could collaborate. In the meantime, can I recommend that you remove your latest 5G video? I think it can only cause harm and confusion. I don't want to see incorrect information from such a well-respected source.